Hey there students! In this segment of my lecture series on women in the French Revolution, I'm going to focus on the debate that took place between Edmund Burke and Mary Wollstonecraft in Britain. And I'm going to give a quick shout out to Olivia and Blake, who are some of my most devoted fans. I've appreciated all of their positive feedback and encouragement on Instagram and all that kind of stuff. They crack me up. And the thing about Olivia and Blake is they managed to be friends. They're from Alabama, in spite of one of them being an Auburn fan and the other being a Bama fan. And I'm sure there are lots of arguments that take place between the two of them. And we live in a society where women can have opinions and argue in the public forum and all of that kind of stuff, but it wasn't really always that way. That before this time, it wasn't really socially acceptable for a woman to engage with a man in public debate, especially over a political matter. And we look at Mary Wollstonecraft, who some people say is kind of the mother of the modern feminist movement, we're going to see woman as vindicator, as someone who is defending other people's rights, defending her own rights, somebody who is taking positions and having arguments against men. So keep in mind that there is a great debate going on in Britain. A lot of the British are horrified at this French Revolution, especially once those heads start coming off. But even before that, there are some people who are very suspect of what's going on here. Because Edmund Burke, who wrote Reflections on the Revolution of France in 1790, now keep in mind, this is before a single head was cut off. This is at the time when you've got the National Assembly. This is before before the Reign of Terror, but already Edmund Burke is laying on that hate, all right? He is anti-French Revolution, that he is already judging it very quickly. Now, the reason why he is judging is because Edmund Burke is a conservative. Now, he's a conservative that champions liberal values to an extent. He certainly was supportive of the American Revolution. Now he said that these Americans, they already had the British system of government and they already were ready to govern themselves. But the thing is, they had the Magna Carta, they had the English Bill of Rights, they had all of these long-standing traditions, and they had inherited the British system of government. Now what Burke sees going on in France is that the French believe that they can just go from absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy. Some people are even talking about a republic at this time, but just very, very quickly and to make very sudden changes. And Burke is very skeptical of this, and he kind of in some ways predicts the reign of terror that's going to take place because he says that the French have weakened their institutions. And the British, meanwhile, have developed their institutions and reformed their institutions over time. So Burke says this is not going to work. And once the reign of terror hits, it's kind of, I told you so. Now, although a lot of people in Britain feel like Burke, Mary Wollstonecraft chose in 1790 to take up her pen and defend the French Revolution in her book, A Vindication of the Rights of Man published also in 1790. So she says here that I'm going to vindicate this revolution. I'm going to defend this revolution. I'm going to defend the idea of liberalism, that people should be able to seize their rights quickly and not have to wait on gradual reform of institutions, that these French people, they have rights, okay? So she is writing to defend the French Revolution, and she's doing this because she's coming from the perspective of liberalism, whereas a conservative believes that rights are inherited. We have rights essentially because we're used to having those rights, and we don't like when those rights are threatened that we're used to having, a liberal comes from the point of view of natural rights. These rights just are. You have them, and if something's messed up, you should fix it on a liberal basis. And she thought, well, that was kind of fun because she has this debate with Edmund Burke and she becomes a champion, a vindicator of the French Revolution. Well, she decides, hey, I've spent all this time defending men. How about... I defend women. Now that I have vindicated the rights of man, I'm going to go on and vindicate the rights of woman. So two years later, this book comes out, which is really the first book-length 
treatment of feminism that exist in European history. And Wollstonecraft is really breaking ground here because she's saying not only should men have rights, but women should have rights as well. And she is seen as the kind of the mother, the champion of what we would call liberal feminism. And this is fun for her because she is defending her own sex and not just men. So really what she sees here, and if you think about it in the context of the birth of the feminist movement, which is something that comes out of the French Revolution, we see that we're arguing for the equality of men first and foremost, but once we've done that, then let's start arguing for the equality of women. And what you see here is a process that 200 years later, some people are still fighting for today. Keep in mind that the French Revolution is the first time where we start to see women become politically active. They organize, as I've said previously, political clubs, even though this is not something that the artist looks very well upon, it is still something that we see women mobilizing politically and for the first time advocating for their own rights. And if you will go on to the next segment on Charlotte Corday, I'm going to talk about a woman as a hero. So that's going to wrap up our series, but I'm not done yet, so be sure to stay with me to be continued.